I'm not kidding when I say this, but I think I just solved FNAF's most confusing minigame, Midnight Motorist. And here's the funny part. Everybody was correct in one way or another. There were clues that we all missed, which changes everything we thought we knew. The scale of this theory is unlike any other explanation that I've ever seen before, tying together so much of the series from the absurdities of FNAF 4 to small details in sister location and connections that go all the way back to the first ever game. And for FNAF's 10th anniversary, what better theory to cover today? Believe me, once you watch this video, you will never look at the series in the same way again. That's a promise. And all I ask is that you go in with an open mind and if you enjoy, consider subscribing. Just a quick shout out to both It's Jessica and Withered Circle who both had amazing videos on Midnight Motorist and who inspired me to make a theory video of my own. Before we can dive deep into the theory, let's set up our prerequisites. What even really makes Midnight Motorist infamously confusing? Well, for one, in comparison to other minigames that we had seen before, it seems quite disconnected from the FNAF series in general. Not only does it not take place at Freddy's, but a Freddy's location is nowhere to be seen, and a grand total of zero characters are already familiar to us. There's no indication of a year this may take place and what happens within the minigame doesn't really seem to have any impact on the story whatsoever. And that brings me to point number two. Nothing actually does happen in the minigame. Sure, there are a few pieces of dialogue and there is indication that we are witnessing the aftermath of something, but nothing else ever happens. Point number three is this minigame gets the award for having the most unrewarding easter egg in the history of easter eggs. If you just so happen to find this really obscure secret pathway within the trees, you come across a huge empty screen with no interactions and no dialogue. You get nothing for finding a secret within a secret minigame. Nothing except a few pixels, which we will return to later in the video. And by far the biggest reason why this minigame is so complex is because it's nighttime, it's raining, the minigame in the files is called Later That Night, and we are speeding away in a purple coloured car, which leads us all to believe this is William Afton directly after killing Charlotte Emily in the Security Puppet minigame. But when our character steps out of the car, he's not purple. He's pretty much the complete opposite, actually. So, is this Afton or not? Just in case you aren't familiar with the full minigame, don't worry. I'm about to take you through the most important parts at a high level before presenting any sort of speculation. To access this minigame, you have to purchase and playtest this Midnight Motorist arcade machine in your pizzeria. It's a pretty fun minigame where you accelerate up to 200 miles per hour trying to speed your way through four laps of the motorway as fast as possible. But on the fourth lap, there's an alternate path that leads you to the juicy narrative part of the minigame. We play as an orange yellow mustard man driving home in a purple car, but there's one other place you can stop. A building with a moderately full car park with a neon sign saying Juniors. There's a reason why I haven't said what kind of building this may be, and that's because we simply don't know. What we do know, however, is that the green man standing outside tells us that we can't be here, and don't make this more difficult than it has to be. More on this later, but it seems based on how many people are parked at this location that Orange Guy has some history here, and that is why he, as an individual, is denied access. When we finally make it home, we are greeted with a person watching television saying leave him alone tonight. He had a rough day. Orange Guy doesn't listen and proceeds to knock on his door, saying I told you not to close your door. When he is ignored, he gets easily offended and steps back up to shout open the door, banging on it multiple times. When there is still no answer, he makes his way around to the back of the house to find this scene. A smashed window small footprints running out of it, and two large footprints by the bushes. Orange Guy concludes that he ran off to that place again, and he will be sorry when he gets back. If there's one thing this minigame is very clearly trying to show us about this character, it's that he is an abusive father. 
And of course, abuse does come in many forms. When the TV binger told him to leave him alone, he didn't. When he didn't get a response from the kid, he started being verbally abusive. Heck, when he couldn't get through the door, he went out of his way to go around the outside of the house. What the minigame is trying to show is a severe lack of any empathy. Just from what we see in this minigame, if I was put in this kid's shoes, I would also probably want to run away from home. That's pretty much the minigame right there, and while the story top down seems pretty cut and dry, we actually just have a bunch of questions with no confirmed answers. What actually is Junior's and why is it important? Where did the runaway kid go? Where does the father's abuse stem from? And of course, how is any of it relevant to the series at large? Let's start with that last question. Yes, there's the purple car, with the possibility of this being William Afton, but what else here can be connected to other FNAF elements and tropes? There is one thing, these footprints in the bushes outside the house. Notice how they look compared to the supposed human child's footprints. They are much larger with more detail, and specifically, three toes. Now when it comes to toes in the franchise, we've already had our fair share of speculation, but this time, it's pretty important because we've seen a few important characters with three toes. Freddy Fazbear himself, Golden Freddy, Shadow Freddy, and of course, Spring Bonnie. Take whatever pick you'd like, but I'm gonna tell you something pretty essential here. If you believe that Orange Guy is William Afton, it's probably one of the Freddies. But does that even really make sense? However, if we say that Orange Guy isn't William Afton, that gives us room to slot in William Afton here. That would of course mean that instead of this minigame showing the dynamics of the Afton family, it's showing the aftermath of one of William Afton's kidnappings. And that, that is how this is connected to the rest of the series. Let's keep building up some speculation so then we can get to the deeper theory within the video. Let's hop over to the issue with Juniors. I think there are two possibilities here. Either Junior's is actually a Freddy Fazbear's location, or it's a late night bar. Here's why I prefer the latter option. There exists a logical heuristic called Occam's Razor. Essentially, should you have two theories that could both technically work, quite often it's more likely that the theory with the least elements is the more correct one. Back in 1852, a man by the name William of Occam wrote in Latin, I'm gonna butcher this, Nomquam ponenda est pluralitas sine necessitate, translating to plurality must never be posited without necessity. In other words, the simplest explanation is commonly the correct one. Why overcomplicate? Why extrapolate? By saying that Junior's is actually a Freddy's location, yes, it answers a question, but it then creates 10 more. Why isn't it called Freddy's then? Why is it open so late at night? Where does the name Junior's come from? And if you want to think about the meta of this, think of it from Scott's perspective. If he's trying to show us a Freddy's location, why wouldn't he just show us it's a Freddy's location? And if we are saying a random place with a different name is also Freddy's, how do you distinguish between what is and isn't a Freddy's? There has to be a line somewhere. Instead, I fully believe that Junior's is a bar. It's midnight, so it makes sense for it to be open and it makes sense for it to be busy. The building has an aesthetic parallel to bars in the 1980s alongside the popularization of outdoor neon lighting, even the name Junior's. And not only does it suffice with the other elements of the minigame, it also helps to build more of a narrative. Remember how Orange Guy was denied access? There's probably a reason behind that. Look how fast and how badly along the motorway he was driving. This man is an alcoholic. The alcohol feeds into the abuse and drink driving. For me, this minigame is clearly trying to show that Orange Guy is this new character who is set up to be an alcoholic, not allowed to enter the local bar, which is transformed into unpleasant rage and abuse, which he takes out on his child. And that's why the kid was okay with leaving with probably his favorite character, Spring Bonnie. It's actually hilarious how simple this minigame is when you just take everything step by step. 
we put together a whole valid narrative by just looking at the internal elements and for the most part, we've been able to connect it nicely to the rest of the franchise. We've stayed within our boundaries of Occam's Razor and our explanation has no stretches or questionable leaps. But we definitely aren't finished yet. There's still a lot of questions to be answered. For instance, yes, this may be showing us another kidnapping of William Afton's, but why is it relevant for us to see? And is this child somebody who we may already know? We will be answering that and many other questions shortly. But before we do that, let's just have a quick break. I'll see you in a minute. As the moon rises, so also rises the tension between scorn lovers. Clara, it's not my baby. Vlad, you suck. Wait, was that a vampire joke? That was so lame, Clara, like I haven't heard that a million times. Okay, well how's this? I'm taking the car. The joke's on you, it's a rental. Well, the joke's on you. I set the thermostat to 90 before I left. Good, I like it warm. Good, because I also set the house on fire. How will it all end? The passion, the tension, the intrigue. Tune in tomorrow for the exciting conclusion. Hold on just one second. Did you also hear what I thought I heard? Let me talk about this for a second. What you just saw was a thrilling episode of The Immortal and the Restless. Of course, a television show that Michael Afton watched every night in Sister Location. If you are unfamiliar, the consensus is that the vampire guy Vlad actually represents William Afton himself. The most obvious connection is the purple suit. And whether you believe his wife Clara is Michael or Henry or Mrs. Afton, she burns down his house just like how they burn Fazbear's fright in an effort to stop Afton. Now here's the part that will either make you laugh or make you cry. Let's replay part of the clip. Okay, well how's this? I'm taking the car. The joke's on you, it's a rental. Vlad says that his car is actually a rental. So what? Well, just think about it. William is very clearly shown in the Take Cake to the Children minigame to have a purple car. But surely, surely with tire tracks left behind and a purple colored car speeding down the motorway, surely he would get caught and imprisoned. But what if that car was a temporary car? What if it was a rental? What if that car holding all of that dread and agony was handed off to another person. And what if that person was the orange guy? Here's what I'm trying to say. All the way back in FNAF 1, there was supposedly a man convicted for the crimes of William Afton. But considering William makes his way around and then gets springlocked and left alone in the safe room of Freddy's for years, this man was very likely to be the one wrongly convicted. They convicted the guy with the same car as was seen on the night of the murder of Charlotte Emily. The guy who already had a bad history with alcohol and the guy who drove that car well over the speed limit just because he felt like it. They had a lot of rationale to arrest him and so that's what happened. Just because this is probably the same car doesn't mean it's the same person. And I think the fact that he is surprisingly orange instead of purple sets that in stone for me. Here's why I absolutely love this theory. And I must mention now that this is an idea I've expanded on which was originally posed by It's Jessica in their video. The theory is so great because it turns all of the red herrings for it being William Afton into convincing reasons why this isn't William Afton. It gives the purple car purpose and it makes me laugh because we all fell for it too. We all thought this was Afton at first. We all wrongly convicted the orange guy. Who's to say the exact same thing didn't happen in Universe 2? But this theory is also really good because it ties up that loose end from the very first game in the series. We always knew someone was convicted, but we didn't actually know who. Now we know a little bit about who it might have been, and it gives importance to Orange Guy and the minigame as a whole. 
Now we know a little bit about the orange guy. He's a drunken mess with William Afton's purple car and he is very abusive towards his family. But we still don't really know all that much about his son, the one that was taken away from his window, supposedly by William Afton as Spring Bonnie. And in the minigame, let's not forget that this kid is what is being drawn attention to. You can skip the mound and juniors entirely if you want to, but no matter where you go or what you do in this minigame, it always ends with you finding this environmental storytelling of something that happened to this kid earlier that night. We've already built up a pretty comprehensive narrative concerning what actually happened to the kid. I don't think it can be debated that the kid left through the window to go with an animatronic or someone in an animatronic suit to Freddy's. And considering that Orange Guy is probably not William Afton, this is the most feasible place for him in the minigame. So, in other words, Spring Bonnie lured and potentially killed another child. But so what? We know he has a pretty large number of homicides. What makes this one special? Notice something interesting about Pizzeria Simulator's Lawkeeper ending. There are three minigames to unlock this, where you must find hidden, alternate endings. The first one is the Fruity Maze minigame, in which we see Susie, from the missing children's incident, get led away from an arcade machine by Spring Bonnie. It's implied all of the children in this incident were drawn away and killed in similar ways. The second minigame is the Security Puppet minigame, a parallel to FNAF 2's Take a Cake to the Children minigame in which Charlotte Emily is killed and possesses the puppet. And the third minigame is of course Midnight Motorist, which we'll come back to shortly. But in all three minigames, a child is taken by the hands of William Afton. And what scene do we receive by getting this ending? A landscape of six gravestones. What this tells me is that all of this is related. What this tells me is that Pizzeria Simulator not only showed the ending to the series at the time, but also massively helped to clear up who the victims were and how they were killed. The five gravestones in the front represent the original five children that were killed in the missing children's incident, with the one covered representing Golden Freddy. The other gravestone in the back represents Charlotte Emily as the puppet, which also helps connect this to the Happiest Day minigame. So then, your question here is probably, how does Midnight Motorist come into this? Because there are no more graves here. I just said a few seconds ago that Pizzeria Simulator really helped to clear up the victims, but clearly not enough. Remember that Scott Cawthon tends to try to answer questions that we have in the community in following entries, and I actually think he tried to do this for Midnight Motorist, but we all missed it. This is my favourite series of cutscenes in the entire series, and that is for one reason and one reason only. It connects this whole thing together. Throughout the course of these cutscenes, Toy Chica dates six animatronics, with the theorist community agreeing that this actually represents William Afton killing six kids, sharing the various creative methods he may have used to complete this. But something we noticed all that time ago was that there's actually a seventh victim to Toy Chica. Not only did Toy Chica refer to a previous date in the first cutscene we see, but there's also a foxy hook in her backpack, implying there was someone else even before all of the others. And I can do you one better. The final cutscene in the series doesn't actually take place at the high school like all the others, but rather this beautiful green landscape, a scene that looks rather reminiscent of the grave scene, the same greenery, flowers and tree. Here's what I think it means. I believe these six graves do in fact represent the six victims we already talked about from the Fruity Maze and Security Puppet minigames, and the six victims that Toy Chica talks about in her cutscenes. But I think that there's a hidden victim, one that is clearly important but was actually left out, and a huge reason why I think we can connect this to Midnight Motorist is because of this 
massive clue that I genuinely cannot believe we all missed. Like, it's just so blatant and I haven't heard anybody talk about it. Listen to this intermission. Look at those streams. Those long, beautiful streams. He'll be mine by the end of the day. I just know it. I told him to come over later. That should be enough. And if he doesn't show up, I'll just go to his house. And if he doesn't open the door, I'll just find a window. Jimmy's always an option. Or I could set the house on fire and wait for him to run out. Then he could run into my arms. There is only one thing that could possibly go wrong. The fact that Toy Chica says she will go to his house and find a window is definitely interesting. But let's look further into that full line. If he doesn't show up, I'll just go to his house. And if he doesn't open the door, I'll just find a window. Allow me to remind you what happens in Midnight Motorist. Orange Guy bangs on the kid's door multiple times. He shouts to him and when he doesn't open the door, he finds his window. It's the same exact thing. It's a parallel. A parallel to show that the two are related. The child that ran away was one of these seven children. And while they weren't that important to Pizzeria Simulator, where the gravestone ending was located, they were very important to Ultima Custom Night, where they make an appearance as a foxy hook in Toy Chica's backpack. That's right, I believe that the Midnight Motorist victim, the foxy hook in Toy Chica's backpack, the victim that was missed out from the gravestone ending is in fact the one you should not have killed. All right, now we're back at this point where I need to make sure we're on a level understanding because as I said at the top of this video, Midnight Motorist actually touches on a lot of different bases and that's part of the reason even the explanation is somewhat confusing. But with the hopes to make it as easy as possible to understand, I'm going to give you some more prerequisites. P post requisites, present requisites, whatever. If you haven't been living under a rock, you've probably heard a lot about the debate online about the one you should not have killed, and rightfully so. The argument is so big and always such a current topic, and the reason is because it relates to the canonicity of the books. Now, I'm gonna be touching on the books a little bit here, and I know that for some, that may sound really scary, but all you have to do is trust me on this. You're in good hands. This is the child that I like to call the seventh victim. The debate that the FNAF community is always having is whether the one you should not have killed, the vengeful spirit pulling the strings in Ultimate Custom Night, is Cassidy, the fifth victim of the missing children's incident, or Andrew, who in the Fazbear Frights books has this role. And it's not even discreet either. He's literally the one character with all the rage and anger and the one who takes it all out on Afton. Basically, Andrew in the books is the soul of a kid with not really any backstory. But what we do know is that Afton really hurt him and made him suffer for so long. Hence, when Andrew got the upper hand, all he wanted to do was the same to Afton. And that's what we see in Ultimate Custom Night. That's it. Genuinely really simple. The issue, of course, is that we just can't put this in the games universe without a care in the world on how it fits. And I understand people's concern and reluctance on that because I was once in that position of denial. But when I tell you that Midnight Motorist is a fantastic place to put Andrew's backstory, I seriously mean it. It doesn't conflict with anything at all, and not only does it give more meaning to Midnight Motorist, it also gives us Andrew's backstory that we've been looking for. It would explain why we never got told it in the books, because we already had it all along. For the sake of clarity, here is what I'm implying. Andrew is the runaway kid in Midnight Motorist. He ran away with Spring Bonnie, and from there, 
something happened. Some sort of torture, which we'll touch on in a minute. Eventually, Afton killed Andrew, and that's when Andrew was finally able to start getting revenge. Much later in the timeline, he pulls the strings in Ultimate Custom Night and kills Afton once and for all. Andrew isn't shown in the gravestone ending with the other children, maybe because he is more vengeful and not ready to rest, but he is shown as the first victim in Toy Chica's backpack, even if he was never actually talked about. Here's the best part about all of this. I, I think it fits really cleanly, but if we instead said that Cassidy was the one you should not have killed, all of this is ruined, and we go all the way back to an even more complicated timeline, one by which Midnight Motorist and this seventh victim aren't properly accounted for. People say that theorists try to wedge in Andrew and the books where they don't fit, but I genuinely think that Andrew is the missing puzzle piece here. But surprise, surprise, there's still more to it than all of that. I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about what happened to Andrew to make him as vengeful as he is, and just like everything else in this video, this is pure speculation, but speculation that I would say is very well supported and something to definitely consider thinking about from not only a technical standpoint, but a narrative perspective too. The answer to this question actually lies with one element of Midnight Motorist that we haven't solved or even touched on yet, the mound. Notice something here. Orange Guy doesn't react to this mound. Orange Guy doesn't have anything to say with the mound. Orange Guy doesn't interact with it at all. It's almost like there's nothing there. But Scott decided to color these few pixels for a particular reason. And what we've been trying to solve is the thought process behind that decision. Here is my take on what this mound is, and I don't expect you to agree, I just expect you to listen. This mound is nothing but a really obscure connection to FNAF 4, specifically the title screen. Here we see a house in the far distance, from this sort of heap of trash in the middle of the forest, which just so happens to include the nightmare animatronics. Look at the placement of the mound compared to Orange Guy's house. It works, in my opinion. My question has always been, why put the secret screen here? Why not on the other side of the road? What was the intent of the screen and what creative decisions did Scott make to convey his point? I'm convinced this is a connection to FNAF 4, and before you disagree with me, I want you to give me a solid answer for whose house this actually is. If you said it's the FNAF 4 house, that's absolutely incorrect, because everything we see in FNAF 4 is as a result of hallucinogenic gas in the sister location bunker. The FNAF 4 rooms are all experiment rooms, experiments on torture, agony, and fear. If you're curious, all of this was revealed in the final Tales from the Pizzaplex story, Dysophobia, where we find out FNAF 4 is all just in sister location, and Afton was experimenting on children here for decades. And something that's key to remember in that story is that the kid in those testing rooms at the time, Rory, actually had the chance to escape countless times. But after 10 years of the same thing, is still in the same place because it was much better than the abuse he got at home. So, considering this mound might in fact be a reference to the FNAF 4 title screen, I actually think it makes a lot of sense for this to mean there is a connection here. Afton didn't just take Andrew and kill them then and there, he took him and tortured him for years. And that's why he is so vengeful. That's why he inflicts the same pain to Afton in Ultimate Custom Night. Heck, that's why the FNAF 4 office and nightmare animatronics even appear in Ultimate Custom Night. This is how it feels, and you get to experience it over and over and over again, forever. I will never let you leave. So, you want my best guess? 
This Midnight Motorist minigame looks so confusing on the surface, but when you take a step back and look at it again with an open mind, it's actually rather simple. It tells the story of an abusive drunk driver, a father who was convicted for the crimes of William Afton, and his son Andrew, a kid that ran away with Afton himself because of the abuse, but ended up in a nightmarish loop for years, eventually unleashing his rage and getting his revenge against his killer. And that would be the end of the video if it wasn't for one tiny little problem. You see, I began making this video a while ago, like over a month ago. And if you didn't realize, in the last month, we had the 10th anniversary of Five Nights at Freddy's. And that came with a few things during a full week of celebrations. And while all of them were pretty cool, there was one that was that was not cool. Yes, of course, I'm talking about the game Five Laps at Freddy's, which I kind of wish didn't exist for two reasons. First of all, the game just genuinely plays awfully and it looks like Fortnite. Not even joking. But secondly, because in Five Laps at Freddy's itself, there's actually a Midnight Motorist course. Wow! Which, like, kudos to the developers of this game because that that is such a cool kind of that's such a cool theme for a racetrack in a racing game, right? I mean, of course, if they're going to make a Five Nights at Freddy's racing game, you have to include Midnight Motorist there somewhere. So in Five Laps at Freddy's, you can ride along the Midnight Motorist course, and funnily enough, it is the exact same layout as in the original minigame from Pizzeria Simulator. You drive past Juniors, you drive past the mound, there's actually a house that's off the off road, but you, you don't ever drive past it. Um, so it's the same layout and it's, it's really cool to see and you've actually seen a lot of the screenshots from the game during the video. And funnily enough, the map isn't what the issue is. The issue is more so with the cart, the Midnight Motor, which is of course purple, but there are two other details about this which I need to make you aware of. First of all, if you look at the back of the car, there is this random accessory, and it seems to be a yellow bunny. Yeah, it's, it's Spring Bonnie. It's a Spring Bonnie head on the back of a purple colored car. That's sort of saying to me, hmm, maybe the owner of this purple colored car is William Afton. But I mean, the same thing applies, right? Like maybe maybe it's, it's just that this car got passed off to somebody else and then they kept the accessories and stuff. Okay, fine, maybe we can get past that. The second thing is the description of the cart, which is only in the game files, but it is Midnight Motor. Talk about a killer ride. This smooth cruiser is the perfect choice for anyone wanting to flee a crime scene, win a race. Ah! Yeah, when I when I saw that, I got pretty annoyed actually, um, because it felt like I was making this entire video and then this one thing in a random game during the 10th anniversary kind of just ruins it all. But I will say one thing, right? It, I don't think it ruins this video. And secondly, I don't think this video is completely irrelevant. Let me talk about why. First of all, and it feels weird that I'm playing this card because I never really play this card. We don't really know if Five Laps of Freddy's is relevant or canon at all, right? That's the only thing with lore in the entire game. We don't know if Scott Cawthon wanted that to go there or if Click Team assumed, right, that it was a purple car and people online were saying, oh, it's William Afton. Maybe they assumed that it was William Afton and so they put this in there themselves. So we don't know the canonicity of that, okay? And I'm not just throwing this away. I think this is fine evidence for uh, William Afton being the Midnight Motorist, uh, the, the orange guy. But then you also have to consider that doesn't solve Midnight Motorist, okay? If William Afton is truly the orange guy, what does that mean for the rest of the minigame? What does that mean for Juniors? What does that mean for the runaway kid? What does that mean for the other person watching TV? 
what does that mean for orange guy as opposed to purple guy? Why would Scott do that? What does that mean for the mound? What does that mean for a bigger scale? Because let's face it, if this is William Afton, what does that mean for the seventh victim, right? That, that just goes completely unsolved and we know for sure that they exist. And if you still somehow don't believe they exist, let's look over to the other thing that came out that day, Into the Pit. Now, in the original Into the Pit story, if you didn't realize, there were actually half a dozen kids that were killed in the incident. Uh, the missing children's incident, to be specific. And so when Scott wrote that, we all kind of went like, hmm, six kids? Mm, maybe maybe they were saying like half a dozen, like, yeah, five, six, seven, could, could be five. Um, but no, because the game recently came out, Into the Pit the game, came out, and there are still six kids. There are, th there's half a dozen kids there, and one of them looks out of place. And then not only that, but there are multiple um, themes of five, but a hidden sixth in Into the Pit. For example, the balloon game is the one that comes to mind the most. You get five balloons in that mini game, but then there's actually a place you can go off screen, just like in FNAF 3, there are off screen things in the mini games. You can go off screen and you can find William Afton dangling the last balloon. Wait, party hats. These are party hats, right? And so it's almost like the five party hats, the five children that were in the original screen rested, but the final one, the sixth victim, or technically the seventh victim with Charlotte, that one didn't move on, and that one is Andrew. And that's not the only place where five into six actually appears. For example, there is all of dad's items. So if you find all of dad's items around uh, the pizzeria, then you have five of dad's items and you can expect them all. And then you get into the party room and there is a sixth dad's item. And it's the same thing with the fetch mini game, right? You, you collect five balloons, there's, there's where the balloons come in. You collect five balloons and then you go into the party room and then there's a sixth balloon. So it, it all kind of fits together here, right? I, I really think like that day was the best and worst day of my life because we have evidence now saying that William Afton has to be the Midnight Motorist father. But we also, on the side, have a lot more evidence for Andrew existing in the game's timeline. And so there's, there's quite a, a lot of stuff going on and like clashing um, because we still don't know Andrew's backstory. And, and I think, I really think that Midnight Motorist is the perfect place for it. And here's why I don't think you should disregard this video or say it's irrelevant or just kind of like say this was, this was useless. Because all these points still apply, it's just how we fit it together. You know what, maybe, maybe I was wrong about the Midnight Motorist orange guy and the one that ran off and stuff like that. But there are still things in this video which you can take away. For example, the seventh victim stuff and the, the really cool Toy Chica line. Like I, I genuinely did not realize that was there for so long and it has to be related somehow. But it's the way that we piece it together which is going to truly matter in the end and that's why I need your help. I think we can genuinely solve this. I think Minai Motorist is one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in Five Nights at Freddy's but I think it's also a lot easier than we all um, we all first thought. And so I think that we can work together and we can solve this once and for all. But if you have any thoughts, make sure you let me know in the comments below and make sure you subscribe. That is the best way that you can support me right now. I really hope you enjoy this video. Whether you believe me on the stuff before or not, I think that it's, it's very interesting nevertheless. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in another one. Goodbye.